I see it. It's nice. Think they have any living Christmas trees? Living? Yeah. Should we go take a look? You think I'm crazy? What? You think I'm crazy? Yeah. I think you're probably we right. We can only pick one tree. I like this blue one here. I like the blue one the best still. Ooh. What is that? Interesting. Oh, jeez. Look at that. Let's make something out of that. Perfect. Got it. What is up, everybody? What's going on? Hey. Hi. Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday. Check that drive out. Look at that. Boom. 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 The pine cone. My choice. Oh, oh. There it is. Hoodies. It only, <laughs> it only took us eight years, but we got them. We got them. Now, uh, if you guys want hoodies, they're in the web store. This is, this is I just, we've had them for actually for a little while now, and I just put my first one on today, and I've got, a, I've got like a collared shirt, because this is my new thing, along with, you know, not cutting my hair. And uh, for reasons, Troy and I both seem to uh, jump into this mode every single, like, near holiday break. Uh, on an annual basis where just all hygiene goes out the window. Um, anyways, I'm really excited about the sweatshirts because it has been a long time in the making. And hooded sweatshirts are my, my most favorite thing ever, ever. Anyways, they're super soft, just like our t-shirts are. Uh, I'm happy with them. I didn't pick them out, but I'm excited that we have them. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> took a little nursery crawl. Got a Christmas tree, it's decorated. That's a big accomplishment as well. Taft hung all the ornaments, even bigger deal because last year I did it all myself and then gave him credit for it. Uh, so I feel good. I feel good about where we're at. But as I was walking through, means just, you know, my most favorite nursery ever, local Oregon nursery, walking all around looking, number one, for a Christmas tree that was cut. And then number two, for some form of nursery stock that could be something interesting, I saw these benches, these benches with all of these red, uh, very, very uh, in the spirit of the holiday type containers and these perfect, and I mean perfect like triangular Christmas trees. And then out of the pack was this one ugly duckling. And, and Jesus, just, just focus on the base here because, because we've got like a true blue exposed root, tortured, beat up. This is, this, is, this is the outcast of all nursery stock. It was the only one in this. I, there had to have been 200 of these things with red bows and this beautiful Christmas motif in the container. And this thing, you could see the trunk. It was like half hanging out of the pot. Somebody had clearly kicked it off of the truck on their way out. And I was like, you, you are going home with me. <laughs> Nursery stock series, let's get it on. Kept the red bow. And to, and to top it off, it's a Black Hills spruce. Okay, now if anybody has any knowledge of Black Hills spruce, it is impossible to delineate them from Engelman spruce. Nobody really has ever explained how this is uh, delineated, uh, at least that I've heard but I don't have any Black Hills spruce. So now we've got a Black Hills spruce, wonderful nursery stock, the ugly duckling of all living Christmas trees, and we get to do it tonight. We're gonna push design pretty far tonight because this tree costs a total of $25 with our discount. Um, and with nursery stock, I think we have to test the limits of our technical capacity and our creative uh, opportunities. Anyways, got Eve on the mic from afar. Hi, everyone. And uh, Josh from the eye in the sky somewhere in the ether. And uh, Jesus, Woo! 
the Lone Ranger, he and I, <laughs> me and him, in the studio, ready to rock out. Okay, here we go. Uh, exposed root neagari when we start to uh, more appropriately, not appropriately, but maybe more uh, uh, commonly orient this exposed root style to the, the Japanese termo terminology neagari. Really what's happened here, somehow over the course of cultivation, soil around the base of the tree got kind of washed down and washed away, and these roots were exposed, and because they were exposed to air, sunlight, uh, the wet, dry, uh, effect, they started to lignify, and it created this really interesting, really kind of um, unique, especially for a spruce, although it's not completely out of the realm of, uh, of um, possible or common, it is unusual to see a spruce that has survived and abided by the, the perpetuation of survival, having experienced a, a condition that has exposed the roots. And so as I started to look at this in the nursery, I thought, man, I'm just going to go ahead and wait, see what we can uncover. And as I'm just teasing this away and looking at the features and characteristics, there is a relatively expansive trunk that exists, an expansive root system that exists below this exposed area. But when we look at exposed root or neagari trees, one of the things that gave rise to the value in this piece of material is the fact that these roots have different thicknesses. I've got a really dominant root here on the right side. I've got a root coming across from the right, across to the front, and then circling back. I've got a higher up root here that disappears in, so I've got different movement. I've got thinner roots on the left side here, which create a lot of variation in terms of that size the spacing, the, the, the shape of the roots. And within this, if we think about sort of the clump or we think about maybe the, um, we think about the, the raft style that we talked about, having those different trunk thicknesses, heights, and, and variation in spaces, as well as dimension, depth, and their orientation for middle or background, same thing applies, right? The same asymmetrical, unpredictable, natural and organic meshing of all of those elements applies to an exposed root piece. So the fact that we have this dominant piece on the right side is really appealing and interesting to me. The fact that we've got these intermediate sort of foreground pieces that have different lines and shapes Really, really beautiful. The fact that we have more spaciousness and thinner roots on the left side of the piece, and this is just assuming that our front um, is going to occur from a perspective that gives them these orientations, but we do have a mixture of elements that creates a pretty dramatic and really unique piece of material. And it's inside of this that we start to think, right? Because when we start to talk about an exposed root, Typically, we're talking about reflecting a hillside or some sort of floodplain or an area where the soil is getting washed away. That tree is existing in that stance. Those roots are clinging to that stance, and they're just kind of holding themselves there. It's a real stability component. It's a really interesting design component where we see the guts of the root system being exposed over the course of that erosion. And naturally, that kind of lends itself to a directional insinuation or some creativity in the form of those roots showing that eroded component and the tree potentially having some, some lean. Okay, I'm gonna just shed for a moment the tag as well as the bow. The bow can go back on when we're finished if it means anything to everybody, which I feel like it should mean a lot to all of us. Um, because it's just such a brilliant, unique piece. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and I started to think about what happens if we play with this, right? And I have, I, I have multiple ideas, okay? I have multiple ideas. So I brought a wood block and I started thinking, okay, what happens if we start to push this tree in a position where we really heavily push towards this base. It gives a lot of movement, it puts a lot of priority, takes the trunk off of vertical, and takes some of these uh, finer roots that have a lot of movement and puts them on the high side, right? Not exactly the greatest demonstration of stability in these thinner roots, but definitely one of the more interesting characteristics and components to this design is having those roots there. So if we start to think about that massive angle change, this opens up a lot of, uh, of really nice visual interest. Right? And I like this. I like, I like to think about how do we create that movement. And you see the interest in these high pieces here. You see the stability of that foot on that larger base, and we start to get that angle. Now, we could contrast this. We could push this in that direction, and we could pull the whole tree back this way. 
but beyond a shadow of a doubt, very authentic, very interesting, sort of uh, almost like this uh, tension-based design, right, where we're leaning here and we're, and we're playing back in this direction. I find that to be uh, uh, appealing to a degree. Okay, I'm gonna rotate this towards the back. Now, I also started to think, you know, when you have this kind of lean going with that lean, the erosion taking out that high side, you have kind of this lower foot of stability, and we start to move in that direction. Do we want to gin the top? I mean, spruce do have these big gins. Maybe it's a tall tree that's kind of slowly fallen over, and we have this vertical gin, and we have this wash away on the hillside or erosion that's occurred. Very, very possible. Do we take that big long piece? Do we split it into two? Do we bring one down as a branch, one up as an apex? This is where we get to start pushing technical capacity and design. That really appealed to me as well. And so as I'm going through, and I'm gonna start this process as I, as I do any other tree, which essentially means coming through here and just cleaning off some of these uh, interior weaker pieces, I do, I do wanna take advantage of the fact that I have a tree, although interesting, don't get me wrong, I'm not being cavalier, I'm not taking for granted the fact that this tree is, is a living piece that demands respect, okay? But I'm also recognizing that this is a tree where there were 200 other trees um, that were in the same production lot, and I don't really have quandaries with pushing the level of these sort of genetically reproduced uh, pieces of nursery stock. This is where I think you cut your teeth. This is where I think you really work on your creativity and your capacity to, to, uh, to you know, consider what's possible and your capacity to, to enact what's possible in a way that's successful for the tree, right? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, what could be done, what you would suggest. It's very difficult to see the tree. Cleaning it out is obviously going to give you a lot more insight as well as me. So let me go ahead. I'll open it up to questions and we'll see if we can't get a little bit more visibility into this big mop, right? And again, when I'm cleaning a spruce, bottom growing branches, weak interior branches, and then I'm also starting to look at pruning off and cleaning up the staggered effect. And you can see just by doing the bottom, that, that little amount of cleaning, removing bar branches and some of those bottom pieces, you start to get a lot more openness, a lot more availability of space and awareness of what the tree has to offer. This is how we start the process. We get to feel the tactile reference from the tree, and this is what's gonna kind of drive us into design decisions. All right, uh, first we've got Kevin. Kevin says, what nursery was this tree from? Yeah, so Means Nursery is a local nursery that uh, distributes trees on a national scale. Uh, they're, they're extremely pr prolific. I believe the gentleman who owns Means uh, also has growing grounds in Georgia and uh, was locally born and raised. And so this is like a little nursery that he kind of created as a, like, as like a, um, uh, what do you call it, like a, a, a local support mechanism so that he could, he, he could grow in the, in the area, but um, it's, it's, it's really affordable nursery material. Uh, I know a lot of people have come and gotten nursery stock from means that attend classes at Mirai because they're just like, you're never going to find anything this cheap anywhere else. It, it, it's kind of a little bit of a, a gem off of the beaten path of the standard nursery um, country in Oregon. All right, uh, Treebeard Steve says, supposing Ryan were to decide to remove those exposed roots, would such removal have to be done in stages and how many years might it take? Oh man, well, I think if you removed those exposed roots, um, you would be losing the character of the tree and you would be trying to turn the tree into sort of something that it's not, which is a normal tree. And if I wanted a normal tree, I would have bought one of the you know, 199 other perfect trees that were there. It was, it was the freakish nature of these exposed roots that I was like, oh, okay, now we have something interesting. Now we have, and this, is, this goes a long ways towards talking about nursery stock selection. When you start to say, hey, how do you walk through a nursery and how do you start to make decisions? Well, I was just walking. I was walking, walking. I took a video of it. The video will be in the library edit uh, of when I found this piece because um, the, the film team couldn't be with me there. But nursery selection is a, an important thing 
to understand like where do, where do those things pop out. Uh, and I was walking and literally there are 200 of these and there's one, this tree, where I see the base is twisted and it's different. There's something about it that is different. I walk up to it, I see the exposed roots, I see the informality of the line at the base. It was sold. At that point it was sold because that was the only piece that was going to offer me something other than the triangular formal model. Now that also could be a Black Hills spruce and this size, so many different things that this can become. This is a, a wide open canvas to create on when we start to think about bonsai being, having the capacity to really be made into something special and unique. Uh, but I love the exposed roots. Uh, if I wanted to cut them off in the event that I did want to cut them off, um, although I think you would probably want to select a different piece of material as opposed to cutting them off, it would have to be very, very slow over the course of time. Three repottings, four repottings kind of a thing. Okay, now I'm still removing weak interiors and I'm just kind of trying to get into the upper canopy. The upper canopy becomes a lot more dynamic and a lot more divided. There's ramification, there's a ton of primary structure up here that's starting to create a lot of, a lot of different options and opportunities. And although, although I am thinking I wanna go, I wanna go creative, I wanna go uh, interesting, I wanna go not, not necessarily radical for the sake of going radical, but let's see if we can make something really spectacular here. The fact that this splits into what appears to be three if not four trunks up in the upper canopy also has a little bit of intrigue for me. Like what's happening up here? How did this become what it is? And I'm just trying to open this up so that we can all see what's going on here and make some sound decisions about the material. Uh, let's see. Up next we've got Jeremy. Jerry's, Jeremy wants to know, could those roots create a uh, girdling issue down the road? And if so, would that be addressed? Um, definitely exposed roots over the course of time can start to become counterproductive if they wrap around each other. Now, as long as they're sinuous and they, and they don't do a full rotation around themselves or wrap around the trunk itself to girdle that expansion, then you typically don't have a problem. And I don't see any of the roots wrapping around or girdling the trunk in, in any way. So I think we're probably safe here. But definitely when you're dealing with exposed root material and you're looking at exposed root material, you want to be very aware and considerate of those pieces. And that's a big part of Neagari in general, is just understanding the nuances and the potential pitfalls of Neagari because it can become something that is very detrimental or maybe even counterproductive to investing in a piece that has some really superficial structural flaws in the roots themselves. All right, up next we've got Kim. Um... Kim wants to know if you could explain the selection process on branches you're going through. Yeah, definitely, the selection process. Okay, so first and foremost, right, remember that all of my design, whenever we dive into design at this level, is completely objective, okay? So the only thing that I'm removing are branches that are not functional or not usable. Now, what does that mean? Well, this, the base of this tree, not necessarily super powerful, but also not super slender and delicate, right? The base of this tree is sort of an intermediate. And what that means to me when I'm looking at structural branches is I don't wanna show the entirety of the line by cleaning out all of the interior branches like I might be tempted to do if it were a very slender, delicate tree and I wanted to create longer visibility of those branch lines. But I do wanna see some visibility in that intermediate thickness range, right? So I'm taking off, say, the first maybe inch of really fine, weak interior branches that are gonna to struggle to be good ramification, but also I wanna see that structure to a degree. So this is helping me open up these interiors. And you can just see this as you kind of look through here. I've taken off all the stuff at the base. I've taken off some of the weaker stuff kind of out along that to show just that first expanse. Now I have left at any junction, I've left opposing pieces because this will need to be determined. Which one, do I keep the right or do I keep the left? By which branches I choose for the eventual structure. Okay, up in these areas here where I start to get into some of this more, um, more kind of clump-like, and you see I have one, two, three, four pieces that exist from this singular point uh, in the apical region of the tree, which is interesting, maybe we choose to use it, but I'm taking off pieces that are existing from that central clump and just kind of eliminating any further swelling or structural flaws, right? Um, my assumption is that I'm going to be bending this tree relatively heavily and thinking very, uh, 
I think very creatively about how we go about using this material, but I do think that I'm at a point where I'm probably gonna want to shed at least one of these pieces on the top, and this big sort of uh, central structural piece feels like the least important piece when I look at all of the other components. And this is gonna really open up the design considerably because now we take down the height, now we change the proportion, and now we start to really focus on uh, establishing a theme to the design, which reduction of the height to increase the appearance and the value of the base of this tree is, is a theme that I want to try and push with what we're doing here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and come back in, continue that cleaning process, leaving my branches that are appropriately sized, moderate in thickness, not overly powerful, not overly weak, right? And taking out all of the unnecessary pieces around them so that I have the capacity to make decisions and see design, right? In, in addition to that, you'll also notice that I'm just kind of stripping off some of the oldest needles in these areas that have a lot of density, just so that I don't have those in the way should we start to design. It's very easy, it's very effortless, and the tactile engagement with the material, that's really where I start to be able to thrive in terms of seeing design and sensing some of the opportunities that exist inside of the tree, okay? And let me walk you through while I'm talking before we go back to questions, let me just walk you through my thought process of design as we get here, okay? Obviously, we wanna see the base, and I've exposed a lot of the base. Let me just pull back some of this soil so that you can see what I'm seeing. And I'm starting to look at best base objectively, best base objectively being kind of right in here, right? I think this gives us a really nice footprint. I think this gives us a really nice footprint. Let me just kind of rotate there. Gives us a nice footprint with this big powerful root on the right side. It takes us past vertical in terms of where the trunk actually originates, and it, it pushes these roots to cross over the composition, pulls in these finer pieces in the background, so we have foreground, middle ground, background. That feels really, really nice to me in terms of something that's workable and something that's interesting. Now, where I'm looking is I'm saying, and as we talked before, do I want to go with that movement? Do I want to counter that movement? How do I want to work with the base that I've been given inside of the composition? Right? And that's where I'm really hoping for some feedback um, now that we've kind of opened it up and started to see some of the opportunity inside the design. I could keep this as a linear trunk. Is it the most interesting? No, because there's not a ton of movement in it. Could I add movement with four gauge? Yeah, I mean, Black Hill Spruce has, has some serious flexibility. Uh, we could probably contort things in a pretty radical fashion. Do we want to think about other? I don't know, I don't know. World is our oyster, young, flexible piece of material, high degree of vigor. Let's let it be as creative as possible. All right, well, we'll wait for some of those results to flood in. Mm -hmm. uh, got a question from Kim. Kim says, looks like a small girdling root on the op opposing side. Will Ryan remove it now, the side with the thick trunk? Oh yeah, this little guy here. Yeah, I'm happy to remove this right here. That feels, that feels totally legitimate. Those are the ones we gotta be careful of. Good eye, good eye, Kim. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, so so far we've got Rafi, Kevin, and Bentley all saying go for counter. Andrew K says if he's planning on bending it more, that really seems promising. The right side has so few branches, so it gives a lot of asymmetric potential. Mm -hmm. uh, Bentley says, speaking of maybe a slight counterclockwise turn, like 5, five I don't know if he means like 5 p.m. or um, Let's see, Andrew K says, oh, Andrew K says, hi, Bentley. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> <Not loud. laughs> yeah, I think they're saying go counter. I would say go counter. That's that's my personal. You want to move against? You want to move against that, huh? I do want to move against that because I just want this to be like a gnarly, gnarly pine. I mean, it's not a pine; it's a spruce. Yeah, gnarly spruce. Yeah, yeah. I so there's a few things that are kind of playing into my mind here, right? I think no matter how we try to bend, and let me just show you the trunk and how uneventful the trunk is, right? And this is, this is again where we get to be really creative. Okay, the trunk is nothing spectacular. Can you see that, Jesus? Can you come in there? Hello, darkness, my old friend. Okay, that is, that is uneventful. That is uneventful right there. That's about as boring of a trunk as you get, okay? Great branch distribution though, hallelujah, I love it, okay? 
when I start to look at this radical like exposed root base and then this like ramrod straight trunk, my first thought is how do I make this look radically different? Ginning something on top doesn't really add movement. Um, trying to add some soft, subtle movement with four gauge doesn't really help the process. So I start to think, well, what happens if we just split that trunk in half? And this is, this is a technique, right, that, that I think does accommodate a relatively thick, girthy trunk where you don't have the malleability to get dramatic movement into it, how do you use it? Separate the tissue and not separate and discard. Maybe separate half dot, half gets killed off as dead wood and half of it's usable, or maybe separate and both pieces are a functional component of the design. So if my front is looking from here, naturally I wanna be separating at a point where I'm gonna have accessibility of branches and I have a lot of branches right here. Again, I'll show you this split. A lot of branches on this side and I have a lot of branches on this side, which means if I go ahead and I just remove this central piece right here, I kind of have a natural division all the way up to the apical region right here. I have a natural division of my tissue. I have a natural division of the trunk. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see, right? And let's, let's just play for a minute. Let's kind, of, let's, let's kind of tease out some of the nuances and see if we can't potentially get this trunk to do something interesting. Now, when I do this, I want to be very, very accurate that I hit the midpoint at, 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 the, at least the midpoint, right? Because by hitting the midpoint, that allows me to have the same tissue on both sides. Now to a symmetrical degree, that might be not as favorable to give asymmetry to the two chunks. But from a tissue perspective and the eventual bending that's gonna happen with this tree, that allows us to have a lot more control over the, the tissue and the bending if both sides have an equivalent amount of tissue that we can work with, okay? And I'm just gonna be kind of eyeballing it here and just kind of flexing. See how I'm flexing that as I'm splitting those trunks? Just kind of moving that trunk splitter back and forth to try and naturally find the fissures and the division of the living tissue. Okay, because I don't want to artificially, I don't want to artificially, and I'm having to look on both sides, I don't wanna artificially necessarily dictate this division, I would like for this to have some continuity and some natural lines that are gonna occur. But if I try to go too hard, oftentimes what'll happen is one of these two sides will become the dominant side and then the subordinate side tends to tear off a little bit more and we tend to lose functionality of one of the two sides and we get locked into one side being dead wood and one side being living tissue. I wanna try and keep both of these to the best of my capacity if both of these can stay functional, I think that's a spectacular uh, opportunity. Now look at what's happening up here. Just by splitting now and by having drawn that seam, see how it's running right up the crotch of that? Really, really nice, okay? And this is the advantage of younger tissue. When we get to work with nursery stock of this nature, and I know a lot of people have said, why can't you just work on some really normal stuff? Well, you know, normal, nor normal stuff, quote unquote normal stuff, oftentimes ends up becoming quite special when you start to apply interesting design concepts to it. And that's what we're gonna see happen here because I bet by the end of this, this is a pretty interesting little tree that we're gonna make here, okay? So now I have to go through, I have to tease apart all of these different pieces and I wanna be very respectful of all of the different branches because I don't wanna damage these branches that are giving me the ability to ramify this design, okay? but I have a really nice separation of tissue here. Really, really beautiful separation of tissue. And that separation of tissue is now gonna start to give me opportunities to move away from so closely dictating. Let me get one more kind of incision in here. Just one more, there we go. Beautiful, there it is, okay. And now all of a sudden, the opportunity to create has kind of opened up for us because we've taken a single cylinder and we've now divided it into two. Now you understand why I took out the dominant upper piece. It wasn't gonna play into that natural split. But what you also start to see with the exposure of that interior tissue in these two parts is, oh, yeah, now, oh wow, okay, that's flexible. Now we can do something interesting. Now, do we wanna take both trunks and move them off 
and have a, a, a dominant upper trunk and a subordinate lower trunk? Do we want to fold one down as a semi-cascading branch and bring the other one over the top of it? Do we want to pull one back in this direction, drop one down, and have that, that branch return? So many different things that we can do right now, right? This was, um, there were a bunch of articles long, long ago in Bonsai Today where Mr. Kimura did this with a bunch of white pines and he would divide them at the top of the tree. Single cylinders, he would divide them into threes, fours, fives and create multi-trunk forms. Really, really interesting. Those were trees that were still at his garden when I was there studying with him. Uh, and they had matured and they had aged and they had really evolved on the aesthetic that he had created. And I just thought, what a creative, what a creative use of material to be able to go about that process with, with some real innovative choice of action and shape and design. Um, and it's always been something that's appealed to me to try and maximize uh, less, than, less than interesting or less than desirable material, okay? So when I saw this and I saw the exposed root base, my mind immediately went towards, ah, something interesting is going to happen here, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna drive a little bit of a wedge down in here. Okay, right down the middle, just so that I can kind of show you where we're at here, okay? Yeah, kind of interesting, kind of interesting. And I think where I want to go with this, because I don't like both of these pieces to be the same length or the same dominance, right? There, there is a symmetry that exists here. I think what I would like to do is maybe gin the tip of this and just save some of these smaller pieces so that if I drop that down, that sets the tone for a branch that's down here and then that upper trunk kind of creeps along and we can create some interesting movement with that. I think that probably gives us some of the more interesting opportunities inside of the design. I haven't totally made up my mind yet, but that's just kind of where I'm headed based on where the trunk is and how I could utilize. Really put a lot of, and think about this, the direction that you choose to go, although the, the roots on the left side here are the smaller of the roots, we do have these pieces that in the foreground circling across the front and we do have a very good foot underneath the design on the right side. So it's not like we're not, we don't have the stability. Now it is a little bit tenuous, but exposed root is tenuous, right? It's expressing a clinging, almost a uh, kind of a last ditch effort to survive. And inside of that, putting the weight on those really small roots by moving away from them creates the kind of tension or the kind of difficulty in that design that I find to be really, really interesting and really, really appealing, okay? I think we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go with this. I'm gonna grab a little bit of raffia. I didn't really anticipate this, so it's not wet. We'll just go with dry raffia because we don't really need super compression. While I'm doing this, I'm gonna put a spine in between these two just so I have a guide. I'll walk you through that as I go about it, but I'm gonna open it up to questions so we can create the most bendable, the most bendable opportunity possible. Awesome. Uh, Bentley says, what do you use the flat side of the tweezers for? That's from much earlier. What do I use the flat side of the tweezers for? Oh, um, well, Bentley, you should tune into the uh, show mossing pre-film stream that's coming in two weeks, and you will see. All right. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah. Next, we got Mr. Reno Casey. He says, can I do this kind of work right now without a greenhouse? No. No. All no, right. this, is, this, is, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is greenhouse mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> what, we're doing, what we're doing now is called don't put this outside. Perfect. Uh, Marty says, how is this tree um, from the first Christmas tree? Oh, sorry. How is the tree from the first tree style, Christmas tree styling doing? I think he's talking about the one from how to make a bonsai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that went to, that, that was sold to uh, um, in a tree sale. So I hope it's doing well. <laughs> yeah, maybe if, if whoever bought it is in the chat, let us know. Um, let's see. We've got Chris. Chris says, why haven't the noble firs, the perfect Christmas tree in my opinion, become a more of a prevalent species in bonsai? They have fantastic needles, much like West Coast's of alpine fir. Yeah, definitely. You know, I don't really know. I don't know. I think uh, the balsam fir is also really fantastic. Um, it's tough to say. What, what, creates, what creates bonsai trends? What creates bonsai fads? What creates bonsai... Uh, desirability and dynamics. Probably, you know, somebody hasn't taken on noble fur and said like, 
this is one of the best subjects for bonsai. And I think the other thing is you have to have a north star. And when I say you have to have a north star, you have to have a tree um, that people look at and they're like, I want that. I want that spectacular tree. And when it comes to noble fir, right, there's been great Abies Lacio carpet. There's been great uh, uh, silver fir that have come out of the Olympics. Um, there hasn't been, I have never seen a truly spectacular noble fir. It's not to say that they don't exist, not to say that they can't be created. I've never seen one. I don't know that anybody else has, and that's probably the greatest limita limitation right there. All right, uh, up next we have Chuck. Chuck says, the trunk is pretty straight for a Nagari style tree. Do you think that the trunk will need significant bending or shortening to achieve a good design? Or, uh, yeah, and I think that was asked a little bit before. You <laughs> yeah, just right. now with the trunk. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. the answer was yes, Chuck, yes. Yes, not only is it needing shortening or bending, we're just gonna go ahead and completely alter it. Okay, I'm taking a piece of four gauge here. Four gauge feels a little bit um, four gauge feels a little bit uh, aggressive, honestly. But uh, when I start to think about the thickness of this and the surface area of the gauge of wire having contact with the, with, the, with the two trunks, I chose four gauge because I think it's probably gonna give us the very best of both of those worlds, okay? I'm gonna take out my wedge here and I'm just gonna wedge. I tried to get this four gauge pinched down as, as much as I possibly could. And let me rotate so you can see this as I do this because this is important and it's important to watch this area right down here at the bottom because I don't wanna cause further split, but I'm gonna use the four gauge just as a little bit of a wedge and then you'll see, once I get it nice and firmly planted down in there, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna spread these two pieces right here. I wanna keep them in the center. Yep, you see that? Okay, I wanna keep them in the center and I'm just pushing until I see that starting to act upon, starting to act upon those areas, right? Now this is the challenging thing because I've gotten the four gauge uh, to be relatively work hardened in this bend here, but this arc is always the biggest challenge when we go about this because I have to take that arc out. And there's different ways to go about taking that arc out, but a lot of times what I like to do is I like to put a tool in here so that I can bend against that tool just to straighten that, and then that allows me now, if I leverage these two pieces against each other, to go ahead and get that nice kind of arc. And let me go ahead and go a little bit more. There we go, okay? See how I clean that up and took that little bubble out of there, okay? Now I need to do it here as well. This one should not be near as hard. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put my tool right there. I'm gonna bend against that tool right at the base. And now I can go ahead and I can drive that back in there and I get that contact with the trunk, okay? And that contact with the trunk, not having space, that's what allows that spine to be functional, okay? So if we have a bunch of space between the trunk and the spine, then the spine lacks a lot of its function, right? So I'm just gonna leave that there and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tie, tie this piece to the spine so that I have the capacity to keep these pieces tied together as I raffia. If I try to leave it like that and I use the raffia as the piece that's gonna secure that, that spine's gonna be flopping all over the place. It's gonna be a total nightmare. And the biggest thing about this is it needs to stay right in the center of the tissue, okay? So it doesn't matter which way I wrap this because this is just to keep the spine in a sedentary location in the middle of that single backbone of that vascular run. And you can kind of see, I'm just gonna be just gonna be adjusting the spine as I work up the tree, just adjusting it to get it into the right position so that it can distribute the force. Now the spine is just gonna be the track, right? Because I've split these two in half, the spine becomes the track. It's the backbone that I can function off of, right? Which is to say, if I'm bending this piece, the only way that this piece fails is if I get a sharp bend, right? But if I keep a nice clean arc, which is what the wire is gonna give me as sort of a guidepost for how the bend is gonna occur, if I keep that nice clean arc, then there's no way that I have breakage of that vascular tissue. And this is how you utilize the wire spine, not as a support mechanism, uh, excuse me, not as a bending mechanism, but as a support mechanism, as a backbone, as a guidepost to the way that that piece can move, okay? So I'm gonna do it on each piece and then we'll be able to utilize. And again, I'm using dry raffia. So dry raffia doesn't have near the compression. Uh, we get a little bit more stretch in wet raffia. I didn't, 
I really didn't know what I was gonna do when I started tonight, which is always fun. I like that challenge. But in taking that challenge, sometimes things that you didn't predict come to fruition, as in tonight. And so we'll go with the best dry raffia we can possibly apply and see what happens. All right, ready for some questions? Ready. All right, uh, Jeremy says, to go along with the girdling issue, if they do not completely encircle and cause a negative issue, will they fuse together? They can, they can. Now I would say you have a lot less likelihood on a, on a coniferous species of those roots fusing together than you do on a deciduous. And this is most obvious when we talk about a trident maple, Japanese maple, um, we see those things fuse together. In fact, there was a gentleman a long time ago, his name was Doug Phillips in California. He used to do these fused root trident maples where he would build these structures and he would have th these um, like hundreds of seedlings wrapped around this structure and, and he would grow them in, in beds and thicken them and they would thicken together and they would fuse. And it was really interesting. Doug's fused root um, trident maples were, were phenomenal. But as far as a conifer, they don't move enough water and they don't develop tissue fast enough to really fuse together in the same way. Now over the course of time, over you know, 10, 20, 30 years, maybe, maybe we would get some fusing, but even then I think you would still see the delineation of the pieces. All right, um, up next we've got Gary O. Gary O says, would you consider a root over rock design for this piece? Yeah, yes I would. And in fact, the more, the more that I'm working on this, I mean clearly I have a very, very deep bucket. Who knows? Who knows what's inside of this thing? The one thing I've learned about nursery stock is you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Absolutely none. This could be completely insane, totally uh, traumatic to, to try and deal with, and, uh, and, and completely unreasonable as an opportunity in design. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's amazing. Maybe it's like reduced. Maybe this is the entirety of the root ball. I don't know. The one thing I am sure of, and the one thing when we talk about nursery stock that needs to be discussed in this, is the fact that this piece, and I'm, I'm just going for as long of a strand as I possibly can here, so that I can um, use the length of this and I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a second because I'm gonna to have to divide it 50-50 at this crotch or else the junction's not gonna to stay together. Okay, so um, the one thing that I am sure about this is doing this kind of work means this isn't gonna get repotted uh, in the spring of 2021. I'm gonna to have to wait till 2022, uh, but the reason that I went ahead and did this is because it's already in a relatively small, relatively small soil mass, right? If this were in a gigantic, gigantic container, then I would not wanna be doing this because I would never be able to keep it dry enough for the minimal amount of foliage that's gonna be left to move the water out of that soil mass. This already is gonna be pushing the envelope, but I feel like we can go ahead, Troy and I can manage this. Um, if this were any bigger of a container, then we would need to repot it first, right? Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm basically taking out all of the tangles in the raffia and what I'm gonna be trying to do is use the raffia here at a 50-50 mark, so I'm gonna find the midpoint of my raffia, okay? And I'm gonna use that as the starting point for the application here on the two trunks. Okay, and the reason for it is it's very difficult when you've got this V to be able to get enough of a tightening if we start these two raffia bundles independently, right? There's no anchor point, there's really no uh, capacity to lock in the application of raffia. So I'm gonna start in the midpoint here and just use the tension of the two sides of the raffia together to work for me and help me establish a really nice control mechanism so that the tear of this split doesn't continue to progress down the trunk of the tree, okay? And you're gonna watch me. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna carry this raffia of one side. I'm gonna carry it up until I get to a point where I've got really nice coverage and protection and then I can go ahead and I can go through that middle split and I can diverge into my own little raffia journey here. Now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna wrap this through two of these branches so that the raffia doesn't untie itself. And now I'm gonna come to the piece with the knot and I'm gonna cut that off, okay? Because now the piece with the knot is gonna be running up this side, okay? Now we always know when we're dealing with raffia that we need to have our other bundles prepared. I've got three bundles in the bucket. I've got one bundle here that I'll utilize because there's no way that either of these runs is gonna get me to the top of the raffia or uh, top of the trunk, okay? And now I'm gonna come back the other way and I'm gonna use this in an opposite direction, really nice and clean, 
always, always clean, right? Raffia needs to look clean. Raffia needs to uh, be applied in a clean fashion because the way that raffia looks has a direct impact on how well it functions. The cleaner it looks, the better, the better the job of even distribution, tension, and the ability to distribute the force has been accomplished through its application, right? So raffia should look really sharp. Now dry raffia, total nightmare, absolute nightmare, okay? And I'm already at a point at this sort of initial turn where I need to transition my raffia in order to be able to continue doing this effectively. Again, we're gonna go not forward, and I'm gonna go ahead and use the branches to help me. Not forward, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap over so I can, so I can release. Okay, I'm gonna undo backside, hold that, strands up. Come on now. Hold over strands. Fold over, fold over, go, go, go. Okay. Whew. Wow, that was tenuous, but we got it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to carry those forward, small space, clean raffia. This is like watching underwater basket weaving. Yeah, that's always a, a, a nice joke, but I've heard that that's pretty, pretty legitimately difficult. I mean, it, will you make it? <laughs> I mean, raffia looks pretty <laughs> difficult to me. <laughs> well, the smaller the tree, the harder the raffia is, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we You're transition now. Yeah, I'm ready for questions whenever you are. Okay. Let me get rid of all cool. this, this raff here. All right, yeah. uh, we've got... Tribute Steve. Tribute Steve says the trunk line is rather boring right now. Can enough interesting eye-catching features be added elsewhere that the straight trunk reduces the background per of perception? Well, I mean, I think this is the challenge, right, Tribute Steve? Like, we are in this to win it. Uh, nursery stock is available, it's affordable, it's accessible, and nursery stock demands that we come up with really creative solutions to make it a visual value for the creation of bone size. So, you know, if, if we get to the end of this and we're like, oh, that, that, that tree doesn't really look that good, we didn't lose that much. But I think if we get to the end of this and we're like, holy cow, that tree became something entirely different, which is, which is really, I think, what, what we're all gunning for when we create bone size, not to go mediocre, but to create something special. You know, then all of a sudden it's like, hey, here's an idea that everybody can take and apply to mediocre material that has similar characteristics. And that's that's really where the nursery stock series, I think, has a lot of value, is just opening the door to ideas, to ideas, to creativity, to approaches, all of that stuff. All right, up next we've got Chuck. This one's from a little while ago, but I think we could still answer it. Um, rather than splitting the trunk into two, applying the splitter in intervals along the trunk to facilitate bending the trunk. What do you think of that? Yeah, so I see people do this, and I've never seen it give a really good result. Does it make it more capable of bending? Yeah, I guess in some like roundabout, uh, odd um, kind of butcher hack job way where you have a lot of scarring, you have uh, abnormal swelling, and you still don't get the severity of, of the bending in terms of angularity as the byproduct of that technique. So I've never really understood that, Chuck, and that's not to poo-poo the technique, uh, but it definitely is to share my very strong feelings that I think it's silly. All right, up next, we've got Tribute Steve again. He says, Ryan, do you know about the cold hardiness of Pinus radiata? Because there's a somewhat forlorn looking at Pinus radiata Christmas tree available at a lo local supermarket, and this thread is giving me ideas. Yeah, see, Tribute Steve, there we go. There it is. Um, cold hardiness for radiata. I don't, but here's what I do know. In Australia, Canberra is, uh, is in the interior, the capital of Australia, and um, which apparently it was, it was, it was uh, designed in the interior of Australia to be away from the sea and seaward attacks. Anyways, you might wanna check that out, but I thought that was fascinating and very strategic. Um, but on the way to Canberra in the highlands outside of Sydney, um, there are a lot of radiata plantations and the radiata plantations 
um, get extremely cold. It gets very cold, it's very windy there, and they're extremely tolerant of it. My assumption is, is that they are quite tolerant, but they are natively a coastal species, right? Which, which we're all aware of, radiata, Monterey pine. Um, and so I don't, I don't honestly know the extent to their cold hardiness, but I, um, but I, would, I, I, would, I would guess you probably have a pretty wide berth. All right, up next is Maria. Uh, I think she's referring to trunk splitting, but can you do this operation with deciduous trees as well or maybe certain species that will allow it? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the opportunities are with deciduous trees, but I know that I certainly would want to try. The problem with deciduous trees is they are so water conductive and they have such a, uh, such a shift of their water allocation resources that I would tend to think that deciduous trees may not be able to compartmentalize the size of wounds that a less water conductive coniferous species like a spruce, like a pine, um, like a juniper can tolerate and have the capacity to really endure. So that's where my concern, and I think where I would potentially see this technique not being applicable, but I don't know that anybody's ever tried to trunk split deciduous trees and, and bend them. I mean, maybe they have and I'm just not aware of it. And if so, I would love to, I would love to, to see it or to, to learn about it, but maybe, maybe, it, it, maybe they've tried and it's just failed. And that was, that was sort of the, the consensus that they came to, okay? Not a bad application of dry raffia, but dry raffia is a cumbersome little animal because it doesn't want to stick to itself. It always wants to fall apart. We can deal with that. All right. That's, uh, a, that's, a, nur that's a nursery stock raffia job. Beautiful. Well, Looks kind stunning. of. Kind for of. for being dry, right. I mean, wow. It's all right. Yeah, it's clean. I mean, I'm a bonsai professional. I should be able to apply raffia. <laughs> uh, let's see. Treebeard Steve says, will you put, uh, oh, just kidding. We already did that. We did put wire cores. That is correct, Treebeard Steve. Uh, up next, we've got Gary. Gary said, what time of year is it okay to do the split? And is what makes now not too late? Oh, I think this is a terrible time. I think this is a terrible time for everything that we're doing. Do I think that the tree is going to suffer? No, because it's a, it's a, it, this is literally like a, uh, a six or seven year old Sitka spruce. And this is where we have to understand um, and, and, be, and, and I, wanna be, I want to be um, respectful. I think we talked about this. I want to be respectful of the material. It is a living plant. Uh, but I also, you know, that's like, God, for lack of, for lack of a better comparison, you know, the, the difference between uh, a lab rat and, and uh, you know, some sort of um, rats of nim type, type of like rat with a personality character, you know, or something like that. Like, uh, these are lab rats of, of the plant world. And, and it's not to say that they can't be wonderful bonsai. It's not to say that they can't accumulate personality over the course of time. But when you talk about nursery production, these are genetically uh, identical duplications that are uh, engineered, designed, crossbred, hybridized to give the characteristics that allow them to be produced rapidly and with the least amount of problems, issues, et cetera, right? And, and so do I have a problem pushing the envelope of this versus a 300-year-old spruce coming out of the mountains that has uh, you know, some significant native history with the land. No, I don't. It's a seven-year-old spruce that has the ability to tolerate a lot more punishment because its vascular system is not impaired. Um, it's incredibly, I would say, wide open to uh, energy distribution. It's incredibly malleable in its uh, vascular system. And this is where we can go ahead and push the envelope a little bit, refine our skills, enhance our techniques, try some things that we wouldn't normally feel comfortable doing because we spent $25. It has a unique character that makes our time worth it, but it's not so valuable that we need to be uh, petrified by the act of doing bonsai and, and doing something like a trunk split. So the timing of this, you know, the fact that these are available right now is what led to me selecting a Sitka spruce. And the fact that I have a greenhouse is what leads me to feel like, okay, I'll go ahead and push the envelope because I have a young tree that I can put in the greenhouse and I feel comfortable and confident. I'm not doing this with the expectation it's going to die, but I also don't want to be doing this with, with any sort of mis communication that now is not necessarily the ideal time to be doing this. I definitely would want to be doing this operation 
at a point in time in the year where we were in a more active growing season if this were a much more complex or valuable piece of material. All right, our next question is from Thomas, and I'll read this as it's written. Hi, y'all, what in tarnation do you do with the exposed area and that split? It seems like we have covered that a little bit, though, but uh, if we didn't have raffia, are there alternatives? Um, I feel like if I say there are alternatives, then people will use that and take the liberty of not focusing on their raffia skills, right? Raffia is still the very best resource. Let's just be, let's be really honest about raffia. Raffia, the reason that people look for alternatives, raffia is super easy to find. It's a sustainable product sourced from raffia palms um, and the dry fronds. Very, very sustainable product, um, very accessible, very available. And I think the application, right? So, so we get through this. This looks nice. That's dry raffia. That's not too bad for dry raffia. Again, uh, you know, if it were wet, it would be super duper clean because you would see it adhere to itself. It would stretch and really create compression that lock that in. But this is, this is workable raffia right now, okay? Now we talked about the upper portion of this piece, so I won't give you a, a substitute for raffia, but there might be, right? They're just not as good, okay? So learn to use raffia. All right, so when we start to talk, and we created a raffia video for you for this purpose. So I feel good in saying, learn to use raffia. Here's how you do it, right? Okay, we talked about taking off the top of this piece. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pretty hard here because I've got this loaded up now and I've got this spine on the backside, right? It's gonna follow this arc and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna crank and see if I can't, can't really get some nice, Okay, and I'm gonna rotate just a little bit here. Oh, I like that, I like that. Okay, really nice, interesting kind of movement here to it. And when we get this down, we start to recognize, okay, I don't really need this. I don't know what this is gonna become. Let me go ahead and just uh, go, go forward with it. I don't know what this is gonna become. Maybe that becomes a piece of deadwood over the course of time. Okay, but these branches here, these have the capacity to be something. I'm gonna take the, the pieces off of the direct and immediate bottom. Okay, I'm gonna leave the lateral pieces here. But that feels, definitely feels like it can become something. Let me see if I can go a little bit farther with it. See, and this is the thing about spruce. Once we, once we dissect that, let me go ahead and just get that right there, okay, structurally that's gonna give me the return. Once we dissect that, now look at the movement that I can put into that, right? Boom, and that return, just that little hook on that tip, if I cut that tip short, I lose my point of leverage, right? So I'm gonna leave that, as hideous as it is, we'll come back, we'll turn that into deadwood, okay? But this is interesting, let me go down just a little bit more here, I'm gonna play this as much as I possibly can. Ooh. Okay, something nice, something creeper. This might be the whole tree in the future, right? Apex sitting here, little branch sitting here, nice compact tree. Let's see what this becomes. We won't be cutting this back to that minimal amount of foliage at this point in time in the design. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. Let me go ahead and get rid of these pieces here. And let me go ahead and get rid of that. And we'll come back and decide on that. Okay, so I'm gonna say, if this piece can start going to the back and come back towards the front, as opposed to sitting over the top of these two branches, sustainably that's gonna be better. So let's go ahead and let's go to the back here. Okay, now notice how I'm functioning. And this is a piece where I've split the center out. So now I have this flat section here, which means I can roll that flat section and I can change its direction but I've always gotta be playing that as if it's a tape measure, right? So it's like this, right? And I can take this up here, or I can take it down here, or I can take it anywhere in here, but I can't take it here. That's the limitation, right? So I've always gotta respect that plane. So now that I've rotated this back in that direction, and I can continue to go back in that direction, right? But now I've gotta rotate, and this is where I'm gonna grab this wire again, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna carry this wire up and onto my structure to give myself a leverage point much like I did down here. Okay, and now I'm coming back. Okay. 
Okay, make something fun. Make something fun. Make something interesting. Okay, now, now branch selection becomes much more of a discussion because now I've got branches growing off of the inside here that make it really, really challenging. Okay, growing up into each other right here. Hey Zeus, let me just go ahead and show this. Okay, I'm gonna get you, can you focus on these pieces right here? Can you see those right there? Okay, these two pieces. Josh, go ahead and bring me in, okay? Notice how this one's growing up and this one's growing kind of off of the interior but a little bit better position. I'm gonna take this one out. Okay, that creates the space for this one. Okay, now maybe this one drops down off of the outside, but I have another one right next to it in a little bit better position. I'm gonna take that one out. Now I'm starting to set my branching structure based on position. Really, really nice. Now obviously this is where the split occurred. This is where my wire spine is. It wraps around here now, right? So there's no branching, but look at what I have here. Boom, drop that back in. I've got a little bit of this. Boom, I'll, f I'll, I'll kind of fudge this over into here. And we start to fill that space. Four gauge, why did I use four gauge? Awful heavy for this small of a tree. Yes, and it allows me to move things in any way that I want. Okay, Jesus, go ahead and show this movement from here, just so we show the compound nature of that movement, right? So again, when we come in here, I took this piece and I rotated it here. Now my spine is on this side, and then I took this and I rotated that there. And I got that really nice compound, but here's what else. This is twisting up through here. Okay, so if I wanna continue that twist, I absolutely can. And if I wanna lower this down, I absolutely can. The four gauge gives me total control, right? So then once we get into this stance where we're starting to look at this thing with all of these exposed roots, now we're starting to talk about some seriously funky sauce here, okay? I'm gonna lay out the structure so that you can see it because it's a big mess right now. Primary lines of the design, beautiful, and it bent beautifully, okay? I have no doubt this is gonna survive. With those bends, smooth, equal distribution of, of, of uh, vascular mass, all good. Okay, Eve, go ahead. Great, uh, up next is Kevin. What is the best season to administer this work? Fall before winter? I would say, I would say that this piece is either, you know, I would say spring as the buds just start to swell um, is probably your number one time to get away with this kind of work. When you go late, late summer, early fall, just prior to vascular production, I think you probably get into a little bit, I think you get into a little bit of an iffy time frame uh, because there's still a lot of heat potentially at that point in time in the season. And this kind of work with a lot of heat can really backfire on you because we did do a vascular, a major vascular uh, piece of surgery, if you will, by opening up that tissue. All right, uh, up next is Tony. Tony just wants to confirm what size wire that you were using in the spine. That was four gauge wire, four, correct? Four gauge in the spine. Yep, now I'm using 10 gauge to wire out these smaller branches. Now when I'm wiring these out, because I've completely inverted, I completely inverted this, I really have to be acknowledging of the top of these, right? Because this is the bottom of these branches. After I inverted it, now you're seeing the bottom of these. I've got to push these back out to have the top still facing top. Spruce is very, very phototropic. It's very, very sun sensitive. So it's phototropic, it'll grow towards the light, but if it burns before it gets to reorient its foyer mass, it'll just die. So I can't ever leave the bottom of the foyer mass um, facing up towards the sun or it will burn really, really bad and just be a complete loss. Okay, so, so being very aware of that is an important aspect of being able to invert or change the orientation this dramatically on a spruce. And again, because this is such a young tree, we really do have the ability to go far and wide in terms of our creativity. Um, that's what makes this kind of work really, really fun. But once you perform a piece of work like this and you start to say, holy cow, that tree actually, I can't believe it turned out. I hope it lives. That's when you're like, oh goodness, I should have done a little bit better job when I wasn't when I wasn't necessarily as bought into, right? Say in the beginning, I bought this for 20 bucks. I said, look, it's kind of a piece of shit. We won't raffia it, we'll do this. If it breaks, it doesn't matter. And suddenly, a lot of problems later, it looks good and you're like, oh, I hope it lives. Just put the effort in in the beginning. Make every technique sound, make every technique executable. And suddenly when it does work out and you're like, I gave it every chance, it's gonna live and it's this awesome. It's like going, it's like Christmas, right? Huh. Oh, did you look at that? Oh, did you look at that? Christmas tree. Oh, <laughs> funny, funny right, seeing uh, you here. Funny seeing you here. 
Next, we've got Thomas. Thomas says, I've got a box wet. I did the same operation on a year and a half ago. When do I take the raffia off and what will the split look like? Um, good question. Boxwood does not accumulate vascular tissue very quickly. So that is a question that I think we both have. What will that look like? How will that, how will that respond? I have no idea, but I would say you can take the raffia off. I tend to leave the raffia on and we had this conversation. I don't know if it was a live Q and A, might've been a live Q and A, might've been the, might've also been, um, the stream with the, uh, the pitch pine last week, but somebody asked, how long do you leave raffia on? And I have students that'll take raffia off immediately after bending. I typically leave it on until the tree swells and the raffia naturally kind of parts from the, kind of parts from the tissue. I think it's, I think it's uh, there's no rule of thumb in terms of how long you leave it on. It does lose a lot of its holding capacity after it dries out. If you've wet it and you've bent, you've gotten the maximum capacity out of raffia. So I think you could take it off relatively soon. Um, I just wait until it swells and starts to naturally degrade uh, because we have so much work here. I can't be watching raffia, but I think you could probably take it off. All right, uh, Mr. Reno Casey wants to know, can we do less aggressive work this time of year without a greenhouse? I think he wants to know what is the limit of this type of work? I would say we are, without a greenhouse, we are at a time in the year, if you're in a place where you experience freezing temperatures, where you're really handcuffed by, uh, by the dormancy of trees, right? To, 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 to do anything other than, you know, unwire, maybe clean some dead wood, um, Potentially, potentially do some live vein work on your junipers, uh, not reduction, but just cleaning um, stuff. Rudimentary maintenance-based activities like that is the extent to which I would say you, you, you could or should work on your trees because they are, we are now at a point in, in North America and in the Northern Hemisphere where, where work is dormant. And unless you're in you know, the, unless you're in the, the, the Gulf or unless you're in Southern California or places where you're really almost subtropical or not gonna experience tremendous freezes, doing heavy work at this time of year will, will cause you a lot of problems. It'll cause you a lot of problems. All right, Kevin wants to know what species work best for this kind of work and what species won't respond well to this work at all? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think spruce definitely, when they're young, have a, have a tolerance for this, as, do, as does, uh, mo do most trees and species when they're young. Um, but we did talk about deciduous trees. I think this is a, a real challenge to think that deciduous trees could, could tolerate this kind of um, vascular division. Seems like that's pretty optimistic. Uh, I wouldn't totally rule it out, but I would say, yeah, there's a, there's a very limited chance that, that, your, that your deciduous tree is going to respond favorably to this. Um, so I think you're probably talking mainly conifers, and I think inside of conifers, pines and junipers are the most tolerant, elongating species, have some nuances, but youth, again, is empowering in plant material. Youth is very, very empowering. Awesome. Uh, next, we've got Thomas. Thomas wants to know, what did you do with the area below the V of the wire, and how do you heal that area? Um, well, I wrapped it with raffia so that the crack could not continue running, and I had control. And that was the big part of the beginning of the raffia, was using the raffia to really uh, protect that sensitive area, because it is, it is incredibly dangerous. Uh, for that, when we start to bend those apart, for that to continue to tear and to lose control of that is to lose control of the shape as well as the success of the operation. The biggest thing to success when we start doing heavy bending and work of this nature is to maintain dictatorial control. Dictatorial control over the way that the tree behaves and responds. And the way that we do that is just sound execution and that's where the raffia really mattered. Um, because there was, you know, and I'm sitting here like, oh, you guys should always prepare your material. Don't, don't, don't assume that, that it's not worth anything or that you're gonna wanna, you know, that you're not gonna care about the outcome. Because I was thinking, do I need to raffia this? I don't wanna raffia this. You know, but I'm glad that I did because I think this is gonna turn into a really interesting piece. And had I not raffiaed this and it, and it suddenly broke or something, I would be like, wow, that's really unfortunate that I took that, that, I took that decision making and that path towards uh, this piece of work. I think this is gonna be awesome. All right, um, Treebeard Steve wants to know, how long will the spines be left in place? Yeah, so I'm assuming, 
I'm taking quite a bit of foyer mass off. I'm going to carry this to the greatest, the greatest form of completion that the piece of material and my skills will allow, which it should look good. By the time we're done here, this should look really, really good. Um, however, uh, the, the foyer reduction that we're performing on this tree is going to slow down its vascular productivity. And so, whereas a spruce does produce a very high quantity of vascular tissue over the fall season, I doubt that we're probably going to see next year a robust amount of vascular productivity just based on the amount of foliar mass that we've removed. Now again, it is a young tree, and a young tree does have the capacity to behave and respond in ways that are pretty impressive. And so maybe, maybe, um, this tree out, outperforms our expectation and, uh, and we get vascular productivity that swells and that starts to push the raffia apart because it's degraded in the ultraviolet uh, sun and we're able to remove the spines and the raffia next fall. I could see that happening just because of the youth of the tree and the vigor of the tree. But I'm assuming, okay. I'm assuming it'll be at least a year. Okay. Um, up next, we've got Wesley. Wesley says, I usually think it's good to have more roots to power the tree. You just alluded that it's better to repot than style. Why? And uh, is this to slow the foliage growth? Well, um, so I, I definitely agree you want good, strong roots to power the tree. However, when we start to talk about and we say, listen, nursery stock, uh, generally we want to generally we want to repot first. I want to use the foliar mass. When you think about the repotting, and again, this is a small container, which is why I was willing to do this. When you think about the foliar mass, the foliar mass is what generates the sugars and starches that creates vascular tissue. Roots are a vascular tissue. So to create the root mass after, after you've heavily reduced the foliar mass is, is almost impossible. So if you use that foliar mass, you do the heavy root reduction to a much smaller bone size size container, and then you come back in style right? You've used that foliar mass to regenerate that root mass. Now you have the root mass in a smaller container with less water holding capacity. So when you reduce this foliar mass, it doesn't have to power the regeneration of roots. It already did that. And reduction of this foliar mass means that you have the right proportion of foliar mass to move the water out of that container, right? Because if this is too big of a container and I take 90% of the foliage off, only 10% of the water conductive foliage is left for a container that is way too large. And what happens is too much water sits in the container and rots the roots because there's no movement of that water via transpiration of the foliar mass, right? And that's what we have to remember. The, the, the needles are conducting that water. That's how you get water out of the container. You allow the tree to transpire. When we reduce that, if we have a big, heavy, water-logged uh, soil system, then we start to get anaerobic conditions and our root system starts to deteriorate and we see failure. All right, um, up next we've got Thomas. Thomas says, I see why you put dry on the inside. How come the rat, oh, sorry, we already covered that. Not what, because of just convenience, folks. Yeah, it, it, uh, was, it, was, total, it was totally convenience-based, right? So that was, my, that was my one fudge factor. I'm happy that I put raffia on it uh, because, because now it's, it's, it's gonna be a pretty, ch pretty charming little tree. And if I hadn't, and then things went awry, and then I was like, oh, dang it. I, I, I totally, um, you know, undershot the mark, right? Uh, then I would be bummed, but I, I didn't do that. We did it right, and doing it right means you get rewarded, and that's exactly what's happening. All right. Uh, Marty wants to know, how long will it take this tree to heal from this operation? Can you try to explain how the trunks will look? I'm having trouble visualizing the end result. Yeah, well, the end result, you're going to see, um, you're going to see a pretty close end result tonight because it's going to look pretty outstanding by the time we're done. Uh, but the trunks will roll, the callus will roll. And one thing that you noticed is I took the, the trunk splitter and I used it and I kind of left a really rough tear as that tissue tore apart. That's how you make this look natural. Because if you take a saw or if you take a, um, a, a mechanical tool like a, like a Fordham and you smooth out that surface, it will always look artificial, right? So that tearing is what makes the grain exposed, which gives it a naturalness. The edges of the tissue will roll. Spruce produces vascular tissue in a robust quantity and the edges are gonna form a really orange, beautiful callus that will contrast the green foliage and will roll around the edge and really naturalize that bend. So I think what you're gonna see 
over the course of time is, is you're gonna, it's gonna feel like this split naturally, right? In, in 10, 15 years, it's not, you're not gonna know unless you saw this stream what happened to cause the kind of character that this spruce is gonna have. And that, that it's not deception, it's the understanding of the impact of time on a, a, a living piece of material. And if you can understand that and you can play that game of being able to generate natural, and this is where I think the bending that we utilized in the first three years at Mirai, those trees will never be fixable. You will always see the remnants of that bending. Uh, it, it's, it's just a permanent part of them. And that's okay, right? You have to do that, you have to have those failures, um, and you have to observe those failures to understand how you do it better. That's what informed our current bending process, which is why you're all lucky to be learning about it now. I could have taught you, you know, and this is where you do have to buffer the information of professionals returning from Japan until they take ownership of their technique. A lot of the techniques uh, might not necessarily be as effective, and that was, that was one thing that I, de I definitely recognized early on in, in my return as I needed to work on some of those pieces. Um, but, but now that we're here, right, we can share, share the fruits of that experience. All right, up next we've got Chuck. Chuck wants to know, how will you deal with the extensive wounds created by such a split? Will they just heal over or will they become shari? And if the latter, how do you make it not look so unnatural? Yeah, so I think I just covered it, but the tearing of the grain definitely positively uh, influences the fact that that will, because, because I used the trunk splitter and I tore it to expand that, that definitely goes a long ways towards naturalizing the eventual visual uh, impact. Edges will roll. This is a totally natural part of spruce in every way, shape, and form. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what that's gonna look like. I know what that's gonna look like. That's a predictable outcome. So I think in all, in all directions, we've created a system that, that should have a very natural final appearance. Okay, uh, Thomas wants to know if you can do the same operation on nursery stock stone pine at this time. Sure, uh, well, I mean, again, I, I, I wanna keep reiterating that if you can protect the tree and it's a nursery stock tree, that there's a lot more flexibility than if you, if you can't protect the tree and it's a much older tree. I would say hold off on a valuable tree, an older tree, or in, in areas where you get cold winter conditions and you can't protect, okay? I'm gonna put this in the greenhouse, might even put it on a heating bed, um, just so that I give the tree the benefit of the doubt because I'm quite a, quite a, you know. Once I, once I put my hands on a tree, I don't know how you all feel about your bonsai practice. Once I put my hands on a tree, uh, I'm, I'm officially bound to that tree. I'm, I'm bound to that tree in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. Uh, but we've had a mutual exchange of energy now. I've been very intimate with this tree. I've seen its core, right? Like I did a, you know, I, I got up in there. I know exactly what's going on. And so, and so uh, the personal relationship that we've forged in this short time together is strong, very strong. Right, uh, right, right, right. It's good. It's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, let me just let me just rock out here for a sec. Okay. So our front is, and let me just shift. Now that I'm seeing where our front is for the best base, I did manipulate this. Let me go a little bit more here. Okay, and just a little bit more. Okay, and just a little bit more. And let me get. Let me let me take that back. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm gonna take this back just a little bit. We'll turn this into interesting deadwood later. I'm not worried about it now. Mm. Okay, and I'm gonna push when you're that done out. With that, we have a request to see the front again. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do, y'all. <laughs> there we go. Hey Zeus, I'm gonna turn that towards you. Okay, and again, right? Those two pieces. Can you zoom in just a little bit? And this is tough to see just because there's so much going on and I haven't organized it yet. But the movement here that bend and that sharpness of that, right? And the movement through there. That's interesting, look at that. Oh gosh, okay. I'm gonna keep rocking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start to. So I've done all of the structural, right? You see how small this has gotten. You see how compact this has gotten. Really fun, fun, interesting, right? Now exposed root, it makes sense. 
Okay, now I'm gonna lay it out and I'm gonna break this up into smaller foliar masses. I don't think this lower branch on the left is necessary. I'm gonna leave it for this early stage. We know early stages of initial styling nursery stock, field grown stock, we typically end up with some degree of symmetry. I'm gonna try to avoid it, but I'm not trying to push this tree to a finality of like the asymmetrical form in the finished product. I know as a spruce, it's gonna give me a lot to work with. I'm gonna have a lot to respond to. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and lay this out. And again, Really fine spruce, fine needles means they're a little more sensitive. I've gotta be a little bit more delicate in the handling and wiring of the foliar mass. Totally fine. Okay, it just means when I get into the needle mass here, I'm just lightly kind of looping and pre-rolling. Notice how I'm pre-rolling there, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not smashing the needles. I'm just using the wire as a tube. Now, it doesn't give me an excuse to do sloppy wiring. That's not what I'm saying, right? But I am being very respectful because I know if I crush those needles, that those needles turn brown and they die instead of photosynthesizing and helping the tree produce sugars and starches to really thrive, heal, and move forward. Okay, so just a really nice, gentle application. And you can see the initial cleaning that occurred the initial work that we did to get rid of all of the unnecessary, all of the weak stuff, that's really helping us out now because we're not dealing with a bunch of unnecessary branches. We're not dealing with a bunch of bar branches. We're just dealing with a nice layout of staggered ramification as you would expect it to occur in a really, really nice fundamental piece of, uh, of material, okay? And so when we lay these out really nice and simple, even though we have good movement in the trunk, these finer branches, really nice and flat, okay? I'm gonna narrow these down because it's a smaller tree. The more narrow the pads stay, the smaller they kind of represent foliar masses in the tree. And I'm just gonna work through this as I continue to answer your questions. All right, uh, Kevin wants to know, is there a burlap sack around the roots as there would be in a lot of nursery stock containers? This one, from the best of my knowledge, because I was expecting to see that, Kevin, I don't seem to be able to find a burlap sack. I will say, and again, this is, this is, another, this is another one of these conundrums of nursery stock and then saying, oh, we're gonna do this dramatic work without repotting. Um, when Troy and I, it was a little bit loose in the container, and when Troy and I uh, today went to shore it up, we tied down a root right here from the bottom. There's like this much of the container that didn't have any soil or root in it. I mean, it was like, we, there's like nothing there and then it starts right here and it's just so, so they literally took like a, a two gallon and they stuffed it in here and they jammed a bunch of stuff around it and they called it good. You know, so I don't, I don't really know what's gonna happen here, but I'm pretty hyped on this holiday motif. All right, uh, up next we've got Moon. Moon says, will Alberta spruce, Picea glauca, take this type of abuse? They are local living Christmas tree stock where I am. So, you know, I, 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 I think I think I've commented on my opinion of Alberta spruce. For everybody that has said Alberta spruce are so delicate and so challenging and they can't be wired, and man, uh, we absolutely took that Alberta spruce from the stream. We took that thing to the nth degree of work, of foyer reduction, of structural work, of deadwood work, and that thing exploded. I would say yes. I think Alberta spruce is a great subject for this type of work. In fact, I, I find them to be equally as strong as something like a Black Hills. I, in, in fact, well, I can't say that because I've only ever heard of Black Hills, but I can tell you this thing feels pretty robust as a young tree. A young Alberta spruce nursery stock, probably as strong as any other tree you're gonna find. All right, Kevin wants to know, I will only use raffia, but I know people will substitute it with tape. What are your thoughts on this practice? I really dislike it and it tucks, and it <laughs> irks me to my core. I know we talked about this one a little bit. Too. Yeah, well, so you know, I'm glad you brought that up, right? Because electrical tape or, or the horse wrap um, are kind of the two commonly accepted depending on who you study with. And, and in Europe, I, I think they're looking for everything to use but raffia. Um, which is fine, you know, the, like uh, I know Salvatore uh, in Italy used to, um, Salvatore used to always try to sell me on this like weird, uh, weird hemp wrap that he would utilize. And, and I never saw it do, I, you know, I don't know if it would have broken even if he hadn't used it, but he believed in it firmly. Here's the deal. Uh, raffia and when we start to apply this wrap to the trunk, most of us consider the trunk to be completely, uh, a completely like inner functionless. It's a transport mechanism. It's like a, 
you know, I think we look at it as like a tube, right? But what we fail to realize is the trunk is actively engaging with oxygen exchange and water exchange and photosynthesis and all of the other things that are happening. And there's these pores in the trunk and branches called lenticels. And lenticels carry resources in and out uh, to the trunk and, and to the branching. And so when we cover with raffia, raffia being an organic material, when it's wet, it adds compression. When it dries, it has breathability to it. I think that's extremely important. And you see, you can actually watch uh, branches wrapped by tape or by a non-breathable um, medium do tend to have a little bit of a different response, a little bit of a different rebound rate, uh, a little bit, uh, I would say, of a lesser degree of not success of the bend, but success of the recovery. And that's a big part, right? Anybody can bend something. Anybody can wrap something in a, in a ton of compressive uh, material, bend it and be like, there, I, it didn't break. You know, like I win, but it's like, did it look, does it look good? Does it rebound? What's the aftermath of that in terms of back budding, of continued health, of the vigor of the tip, et cetera? And that's where I still find raffia to be absolutely uh, to, to, to the most significant degree superior to any other material that people are utilizing in that fashion. All right. Um, up next, we've got Matt. Matt says, how readily will spruce develop roots if you wanted to create a raft style from nursery stock? It's tough. It's tough to get spruce to develop roots. That is one thing about spruce. Um, not to say that they won't, and a lot of spruce occur in bog-like environments um, where, where they do, over the course of time, self-layer up into uh, the more oxygen-rich uh, areas closer to the surface. But I would say as far as bone size subject matter creating uh, a raft or something of that nature, definitely spruce, you're asking for a lot. You're asking for a lot if you're trying to get a spruce to do that. I don't wanna discourage you though. There's rooting hormone, there's ways to stimulate that tissue to evolve and develop, and I would encourage you to experiment and see if you can't get it to work because if you just take my word for it, and in all actuality, you know, it is possible or you come up with a magical mechanism to make it happen, uh, then me saying that it's hard would, would, would really have Im impacted that negatively. A lot of the things that we do at Mirai uh, come from people saying you can't do that and being like, oh, really? Well, well, let's give it a try. And so I would encourage you, try it out. See if you can get it to happen. Try it in a, in a multitude of different ways. Right, up next is Backcountry Dan. Uh, they're curious if there's anywhere that you can see updated photos of Camara's trees that have matured after this type of work. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. I guess there he were- there, Josh there... over there, huh? Huh? He needs, a, he needs a Josh photographer over there. Well, yeah, I, I think it more looks like this. There are Kinbone magazines that have these sort of updates over the course of time. I mean, they reduce, the, or, or excuse me, they produce uh, one Kimbone a month, and they've been doing so for a gajillion years. So to be able to find them, I, 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 have, I have those magazines. I know they exist. I'm sure, Dan, if you wanted to come to Mirai and go through the you know, 600 plus Kimbones that I have, we would, we would run across those and evolutions of many other famous trees that you would be like, holy cow, that tree's still alive. Amazing. It is very cool to have that provenance and Kimbone as a historical marker, um, as a publication that's documented Japanese bonsai is, is a very, very positive thing in my mind. But it is, it is very difficult to find that information because it, 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 a lot of them are very hard to identify unless you know those trees already. Um, but there, there, are, <laughs> there, are, there are resources where you could if you were determined enough. All right. Uh, Miss Mel wants to know, is that metal container going to be dangerous in that it'll get very cold during winter or will the greenhouse negate that problem? The greenhouse won't get to a point where it freezes. So I'm not worried about the metal container getting hot or cold. And um, definitely, you know, metal uh, is a good conductor, which means it releases and it takes on heat uh, both readily, gives the heat away and takes it on very easily. Uh, so, you know, would it be a liability if this tree were kept outside? It wouldn't be a liability if I didn't do this kind of reduction to keep it outside. It, it would be a liability certainly to leave this tree outside no matter what container it was in after this kind of work. Um, so, you know, but the greenhouse will mitigate and nullify any danger that this would have. Okay, let me just give you a little bit of an update here, show you the front. Starting to come together, really starting to come together. 
okay, and just giving it a nice, and again, laying it out flat, being nice and disciplined about it, nothing super spectacular. My front is somewhere. Go ahead and go to Jesus's, Josh, yeah. So my, my front is somewhere over here, and the camera's a little bit, is a little bit high, so if you lean this back a little bit, you kind of start to see a little bit more. Let me finish up, I'll adjust the height of it, and we'll finish up so you can see it from the perspective that I'm viewing it from. But it is starting, it is starting to come together. A little bit of magic happening here. Looking really good. What time um, is it, Eve? How are we doing on time? Uh, it is 7.30. Oh, oh. You're doing great, yeah. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. You, you just made a, a, a nursery stock styling look easy peasy. It look easy peasy, that's right. Easy peasy. Glide right on through. Uh, Thomas wants to know, metabolically, what happens to the inside of the tissue and what is the percentage of exposure even with the raffia on? Is it totally revealed? Uh, the inside of the tissue. So when you think about, when you think about the vascular structure of a tree, right, the vascular structure of a tree, if you were to take you know, a bunch of pieces of wire, and you were to hold all these pieces of wire together. And they're different sizes of wire as well, and depending on um, whether you're in the core of the tree, of a tree this age, the core has no tannic uh, contamination. So, you know, you have this kind of big central cortex here. And then you've got all of these other bundles running linearly around it, okay? Now, when you separate this, right, and you, and you divide those two, what ends up happening is there, there are straws or there are xylem tubes and channels that stay intact, okay? But oxygen has the ability to enter those. So immediately, the tree is trying to compartmentalize those areas to stop the oxygen embolism. And that's why it's so important for both sides of the tissue to be 50-50, regardless of the size of the tubes, because we, we know that outer surface where we split that on both sides is going to be dead wood. It's gonna be walled off and compartmentalized so that the oxygen doesn't break the water chain across the entire uh, system, right? And then the edges of this where there's still living tissue are gonna roll. And we're gonna see that callus form, right? Where it's gonna roll around that flat edge. But that inside is definitively dead wood because now it doesn't have a cambial layer that's producing xylem to the interior and phloem to the exterior, and it has been exposed to oxygen now, which means the tree has to compartmentalize that tissue. A lot of compartmentalization here. The raffia will help definitely ease the loss of water in the influx of oxygen, but it's not an airtight system, and that's where uh, it's, it's better that it has a buffering capacity, but not a total shutting down of oxygen exchange, as we talked about with the raffia versus the, the electrical tape. Uh, Reno David says, if you had a thicker trunk, could you use two wire spines next to each other could. for the splitting? You could. The problem with trying to use too many wire spines on too small of a tree is you actually create too much force. So this tree that would be easily bendable, right, if you use too many wire spines, you start fighting the wire spines, right? But the wider the tissue, the more contact you would rather have. And so maybe I go with two uh, six gauge spines instead of one four gauge spine uh, if I had a little bit of a wider trunk that had similar girth, similar uh, tissue development, etc. All right, up next is Paul. Paul says, you mentioned that you want the tree to dry out between waterings. Since you reduced the foliage quite a bit and the tree is potted in very organic material, can you estimate how long you will wait between waterings? I realize as uh, it heats up, it will be quicker versus cooler temperatures. Yeah, and I think we're just getting up to the, the, the shortest day of the year and then we're gonna start heading the opposite direction, right? So this, this time of the year is always a really interesting time because as, as we head the opposite direction, we're gonna start to watch um, some of the behavior of trees start to change. Daylight starts to elongate, obviously January's coldest month in, in most places in the Northern Hemisphere. So we still haven't hit the temperatures that are really gonna trigger um, that winter behavior. And they're calling for January to be the onset of La Nina. If you haven't uh, read about that, I don't know what that means, but it sounds ominous. Um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds, Heavy sounds, wind. sounds bad, right? bad. Heavy winds, lots of snow, cold temperatures. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is supposed to get absolutely crapped on. So hooray for us. Um, but, but in general, right, I, I probably won't be watering this. I probably won't be watering this tree more than, than once every two to three weeks in the greenhouse. And that's literally, 
uh, that degree of, of a shutdown of water utilization after this kind of foyer reduction is very, very common. Very common, very expected, and nothing to panic about. It's, it's just a part of, part of the process. Cool. Up next, we've got Linda. Linda says, we may get cold weather for Florida down to the 40s, but we haven't hit freezing in the Tampa Bay area in years. So could this work be done here during winter? Sure. Yeah, it could. Now, spruce in the growing season would have a very, very hard time surviving where you're at, Linda. And definitely over the course of time, uh, they would exhaust their resources. But if you were talking about doing this on, uh, on a species, say a coniferous species, maybe a, a black pine or a, a species that you could successfully cultivate in that region of Florida, you definitely, much like Southern California, you being a tropical region, you definitely have different um, behaviors in plants, you have different species that can accommodate those environments, and therefore you have different, um, uh, I would say, less degrees of limitation in terms of timing. In fact, you're, you're limited by the heat that you experience in the summer. And I know where you're at with the coastal influence, you really don't get that intense heat. So that means that you get a very long, very robust growing season to do a lot of work over the course of the year. And that's, again, the same thing as California and especially the Southern California region. Man, you know, there should be phenomenal, phenomenal black pine. There should be, uh, you know, the be some of the best coniferous work in the country coming out of these areas that have um, these robust growing seasons because there's really no limitation to what can be accomplished. That's not to put pressure on you, Linda, but if you want to take it that way, that's okay too. All right, uh, up next is Thomas. Thomas says, why is it every time I get my hands on a white spruce from San Antonio and I bring it to Corpus, they always die? I had a couple, but they're all dead. I waited at the right time to work on them, but it was too late. Yeah, I don't know. Corpus Christi, obviously you have a higher relative humidity. You've got a lot of, uh, you've got some other elements acting on it. And, and I don't know how much of an impact that has with that transition of environments, but it does seem to me that, that you're dealing with, um, that you are dealing with a little bit of a different animal in those two regions. And, and you know, is it a water-based thing? Is it a heat-based thing? Is it a humidity-based thing? I, I, it's, it's tough to say, but I, I, I do see enough diversity that, it's, that, it, that is a little bit of an issue. All right, um, up next is Marty. Marty wants to know if you could discuss the fanning technique that you're using on these branch pad layouts. Branch pad layouts, the fanning technique, totally. So we did talk about, we understand that we have branches coming off of one side. The top side here is where the spine is. Okay, I'm gonna put my hand underneath this. So when I bring this structural branch out, I don't want this structural branch to be one giant pad. I have a pad here and I have a pad here and they're laterally separated because this is a small tree. So I wanna make sure that this develops into something and this develops into something, but I've separated them to a significant degree. Now the pad below it, go ahead and pan down a little bit for me. The pad below it, when we start to look here, is a little bit more unified and a little bit uh, more expanded, but these are still working together, okay? Because this is the pad that defines the movement to the right of the defining branch. This is our defining branch, right? In the future, maybe this piece gets elevated and pushed to the back as this ramification expands. I'm happy to spread that out a little bit and give the opportunity to either potentially unify this in the future or to divide it and create a whole nother pad. At this point in time, when we're styling rough stock like this, we really do utilize the foliar mass into space, but we also want to understand that the places where we put pads and branches now is in the potential, the spirit of the potential, but not necessarily the, the definitive location. And so that's where it's not, uh, it's not a rough idea by any stretch of the imagination. The shoulder, the movement, the orientation, et cetera, is all very intentional. But when we get to those tips, right, because we've taken so much off and now we have this space, moving those tips to occupy space so that we give ourselves the best expansive opportunity is really the motivation in the initial design. Now, once we build more secondary, once we get into tertiary, now we start to tighten it up. We pull out unnecessary pieces, we define the pad, we tighten the pad, we densify the pad, and that's how we start to get refinement. But in the initial stages, and that's understanding Understanding the goals of each stage of design is one of, I think, the bigger learning curves in bonsai. So many demonstrations, so many instructions around bonsai design center on a, a thought process that we're trying to get 
too much out of a tree too soon, right? We can't, we can't get this to be a finished tree. It, it doesn't have the capacity to be a finished tree. It only has the capacity to be a very rough, raw uh, initial styling on this spruce. That's okay though, because inside of that, there's a lot of charm in an initial design, a lot of charm in an initial trans transformation, a lot of creativity, and then we just watch it build because we took all of the, the things into account that we needed to, to have success. All right, uh, Rafi wants to know, what are you looking for for a container for this in the repotting of 2021? Oof, I mean, I like, I, I'm glad we went with this kind of defining branch here. I do think the longer that I look at this, both pieces on the left side of this tree will be shortened and reduced. But again, we don't have the foyer mass to facilitate that. I'll show you that when I, when I go front and center and I raise the level of this tree so we can all see it. Um, but, but currently, I, I would say uh, going a little bit towards Maybe a slightly deeper semi-cascading container has a little bit of interest to me. Maybe even a, a square with a rounded corner would give it some uniqueness. I don't know that it's, it's necessarily going to be the most appropriate over time, but it feels like it might be kind of a fun stab at, at kind of an interesting aesthetic. Uh, the most common would probably be an oval because it does have relatively curvaceous movement. But I think with the Neagari, if we can get a little bit more length and drop on the semi-cascading or, or this defining branch to the degree where we get it down a little bit lower, I think that we could really anchor a nice kind of deep round or square pot that kind of plays on the exposed root. Now, keep in mind, the exposed root is going to expand. Right? It's, it, we haven't dropped the soil mass. We don't know what's underneath that. Now, maybe, it, maybe we've tapped out all of its potential. Maybe it's got more to give. Right? If it's got more to give, then look out, because already it's starting to create an interesting theme that's built, uh, I would say, a really uh, radical consideration of design and execution of design. And again, this was just the one that stood out of, of, the, of the literally 200 pieces of these sitting on the benches for, for the holiday season, which is so incredibly uh, enjoyable to see it become something other than like a table dressing and then get dumped in the trash uh, a few weeks later. This is, this is fun, it's really fun. This is where nursery stock can really empower us to be creative and come up with solutions, re really refine and hone our design senses and our technical capacities, push ourselves, give us permission to think outside of the box and, and really go, go towards designs that we might not have the courage necessarily to pursue. Awesome. Uh, up next, we've got yeah, John. Let me raise John's this. A... Hang on one sec. Eve. Let me just go okay. ahead and raise this up and then we can kind of zoom in. It's a nice side profile when you look in there. You see the organization, you see the flatness, you see the cleanliness of it. Okay, and let me, let me orient towards the front here because I like the front from the perspective of bringing the apex back this way and the defining branch moving that way. Now, obviously we said initial designs, you're gonna have some symmetry. This piece right here definitely giving us a little taste of symmetry, a lot of big, huge angular drops. This piece on a big angle, these pieces on a big angle to have that consistency. Little bit of up and out movement here to occupy space. I could see, I could see this just adjusting a little bit. Just give me a little bit of space there, okay? And there's a little bit of overlap of these, uh, of these lines. I'm not super worried about in, out, in. Yes, there is a definitive line right there. That's okay. First styling, they can't expect too much, right? We've done a lot to make this tree something very, very different. Okay, Eve, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, this is not what I would have expected for this tree. It's totally crazy. <laughs> totally awesome. crazy. This is crazy, yep. Um, up next is John. John says, so I'm sure I missed a previous explanation, but how does your current bending technique differ from what you did when you first got back here from Japan? Yeah, no, I didn't explain this. Um, I think uh, Mr. Kimura was very mechanical uh, to the degree that tool marks, not tool marks, like he didn't show like the grinder marks or anything like that. Like he would sand those out. Um, but the sign of sanded wood, the texture of unnatural artificiality didn't bother him. And so when I came back, I would you know, open something like this up and I would thin it down with, with a, a carbide burr till it was smooth and I had total uniform thickness and control. 
And it led to a lot of really successful high level stylings and bending of material that shouldn't have been capable of being bent. But the remnants of that are this artificial smooth uh, deadwood on the interior that is an aesthetic and undeniable part of the continuation of that tree. The live vein has swelled, but I'll never be able to go back in and fix that. So what I do now, boom, I bite in, I tear, I split, I leave a little bit more grain texture and nuance to the wood and the product of that over the course of time becomes something that looks like you didn't do it, like it's not man-made. And I, I, that, that is the nuance that I really want to magnify in my work is that it, is that it looks like it was never touched. All right, uh, Tribute Steve wants to know how long until you think this tree will be ready for display in a show or exhibit? Yeah, Black Hills spruce, Engelman spruce, Ezo spruce, these are very long-term projects, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately, but there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with deciduous trees taking a while. There's nothing wrong with, with um, some of our smaller needle varieties of spruce taking a while. But to get the kind of accumulation of, of density, of ramification, et cetera, is a, is a time consumptive thing. So this particular Black Hill spruce being a small needle variety of spruce, um, I would say that you're, you're six to eight years out, um, which is a long time for a conifer to be show ready. Typically, you'd say between four and five years. The eight year mark would be the second rendition, which would be the highest level rendition. And then you start to talk 10, 12, 15, just accumulating age. The first time will be eight years from now. The best time will probably be 12. All right. Um, let's see. Got a question from Ben. He says, is Josh hella jealous of this nursery stock? Press <laughs> <laughs> if he's not, he should be. Josh. <laughs> <laughs> he's, well, we'll see what he says to me, Ben. Uh, I'm messaging him now, so I'll let you know if he says anything. Oh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like we have a before photo right. getting prepped by Josh for us. Oh, yeah. Give it to us. Give it to us, Josh. Show me you guys you got. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. The bow. The bow, I said I was gonna leave the bow on. We talked about, if anybody didn't see Mondays at Mariah, we talked about the discussion of whether the bow needed to be the apex or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the fun of nursery stock, is you can just go for it. Like, go for it. What are you waiting for? What are we, you know, like, get it. Be creative, have some fun, crush, rock out. Like, uh, this piece, you know, the only merit that it had was that its base was, uh, you know, completely rejectable as a wonderful rendition of a Christmas tree. These abnormalities are what make interesting bonsai stock. But, and again, I always go back to the story that Mr. Kimura um, handed me this ramrod straight cryptomeria that some guy had literally picked up at like the Japanese equivalent of Home Depot and brought to Mr. Kimura's. And I just thought, well, that's really, I thought it was disrespectful. Uh, and so I scoffed at it a little bit and he said, oh, why don't you wire this, you know? And he just like really drove it home when I didn't wire it very well. Uh, how there's no, there's no merit in being arrogant about material that the sign of a really good professional is somebody that can make something out of anything, you know, and really engage. The more technique you have, the deeper your toolbox is, the more creative you get to be. Uh, obviously this was facilitated by my knowledge of wire spines and raffia and splitting vascular tissue and, and how that's going to work out and how, cool, you're exposed to that. We're building your toolkit. That should be expanding your creativity, but you do have to engage with it in a tactile level to really learn and have the capacity to do, do things like this more and more and, and embrace that expansive capacity to create. All right, uh, let's see, you got another question from Thomas. Thomas says, uh, instead of cutting the Christmas tree for displaying, why don't people use live trees and replant them after Christmas? Cutting the Rockefeller tree seems like a waste. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that agree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a solid right. point, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that looks like a wrap on our questions tonight. Nice, nice. Uh, I love, I love the challenge. There was a Blue Atlas uh, cedar that was being sold as a Christmas tree that I was like, oh, but it just didn't, it didn't have the same joie de vivre, if you will, right? Like this tree, when you, <laughs> when you see the video, check the edit out uh, when Josh finishes it for the, the library. When you see, I'm like walking and there's all these red pots and there's one ugly duckling malformed tree and I just go straight for it. 
it was this hideous bass and I was like, boom, that one, that's the one. Uh, I couldn't go back to the Blue Atlas Cedar after that. So anyways, but it is fun. It is fun to go challenge. You saw the blue rug transformation and the air layer and everything that happened there. This was a, this was a tree that had a, a, a definitively poor life headed its way. And, and, and now it's in, in really capable hands. And, and this is another piece that just, you know, out of the sheer desire to create and have fun and challenge ourselves, we find new purpose in, in something that otherwise becomes kind of a robotic uh, discardable tree. And, and that's cool, that's really cool. And it's also feeding your bonsai practice. So hopefully you got some creative ideas. Hopefully we built on some techniques. Obviously uh, we couldn't do this without you, so we appreciate you and are thankful for you in, in this season of being aware of all of the wonderful things that we have. We have made some kick-ass stuff for you guys for the holiday season. Uh, the show mossing video should be very informative for you. Uh, pine Deadwood creation handling of domesticated pines and making them look wild. Really nice, interesting transformation of Deadwood. Uh, we'll be here next week, mini stream tomorrow. How do you construct the Fordham, assemble it, maintain it, and what are the tools and how you utilize it? If you have a Fordham, tune in. If you don't and you're thinking about it, you'll wanna watch this. Um, but otherwise, we will see you all next week. We appreciate it, uh, and we look forward to everything to come. Thank you all. Have a good night. Mwah!